let us start as we always do. I would love to hear if you have any kind of morning routine. Morning routine, yes. I I um I wake up and I go I mean I go straight to the kitchen because uh, breakfast is my favorite meal. So, um I make breakfast, I have my breakfast and um uh, uh, then I do a bit of stretching and my daily breathing exercise. So that's pretty much what I do every morning. Uh, while I'm listening, so I do the stretching and the breathing exercise while I'm listening to something in the back, whether like it's uh, uh, the daily, um, the Guardian or the New York Times, just like a, um, as like a, a sound in the background. What kind of breathing exercise are you doing and where did you learn how to do that? Oh, so it was very recent, actually, a few months ago, I was going through a tough phase and my friend Hayden suggested that I start doing the Wim Hof breathing exercises, which you can find on YouTube. And I was literally shocked by after after doing the first one, because it was, I don't know, I felt after I did it, I felt a bit high and I felt like I, my anxiety level dropped very low. And um, since then, I've just been doing them daily. They're, they're incredible. I love that. High on your own supply with Wim Hof. <laughs> yeah. It is remarkable what you can do just with your own yeah. breath. It's, it's amazing. And it's, you can only know until you try. Because when my friend told me about it, when Hayden told me about it, I was like, well, surely it's a, I mean, what is a breathing exercise anyway? When someone tells you a breathing exercise, how could you exercise with, with breathing? But then when you try it, it's the, it's, it's the art of taking all these deep breaths and then holding them for a certain amount of time. Um, it's, it does magical things to, 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 you, to your body. Yeah, you can see why Wim has, has such a strong following yeah. of loyal people who are just obsessed with him. <laughs> um, now we are mainly here to talk about your memoir, Hope Not Fear. Um, you must feel so proud. Congratulations. I didn't find it an easy read, um, but it is just fantastic. And you're a f- brilliant writer. I can't fathom that English isn't your first language. So huge congratulations. Um, I'm conscious that look the process of looking back and the process of promoting a book like this involves a lot of looking back. I know that that must be difficult. Um, so please today only talk about what you feel comfortable because I really understand that that must be a, a tricky process. Um, I often talk about people's childhood on this podcast just to give people a really good, our, our listeners a really good grounding of um, the person I'm talking to. So I would love to hear about your memories of growing up in Syria. Tell me about Damascus and your family and some of your strongest memories of childhood. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the encouraging words. Trust me, when, you have, when, you're, when you're about to have a book published, and especially if it's a very personal uh, book, if it's a memoir, it's a um, it's a very nerve wracking um, phase. Um, so thank you. Um, you are giving me some confidence by your <laughs> by your comments. So I appreciate that. Um, childhood. I I so my childhood was split between Saudi and Syria, um, between Riyadh and Damascus. Um, I am one of five. I have three sisters and a brother. I'm, I'm in the middle, and. Um, um my parents are wonderful they're amazing um but they're very traditional <laughs> so i think i wrote about this in the book about growing up and never never hearing my parents saying that we're proud of you and how the effects that can that can have on on us but i would love to say like i would love to show the positive things of how like caring and loving they were and how they like uh, despite all the difficulties that we had um, and back then, they always wanted to provide for us, to care for us. Um, they didn't have the vocabulary to express that, uh, but their actions spoke like very loud. I was um, a, a troublemaker. I was a very annoying child. Um, I, I often threw tantrums. I, um, I, I. I I was very needy and um, 
I was obsessed with video games and with watching films. Uh, and as a child, like, I've always wanted to, like, I was always curious. So I grew up in a, in a, in a conservative, traditional society, which was very insular and was very closed. But I was always curious. I always had questions. And because back then we didn't have access as children these days have, um, I would go to my parents to ask these questions. And unfortunately, not, my, all, not all of my questions were asked. Um, but despite all of that, I, I did like, I did have, a, I, I would, li- I would like to say that I had a happy childhood. Uh, I have so many memories of, of us back home, like, especially in our first house. First, it was an apartment actually just crowded around a dinner table. And, um, uh, the, the, the highlight of the day was eating. I love eating. I mean, I, I, I think I've established that now. <laughs> food is such a feature. I love it because I'm also a, a big, big food person. <laughs> and the food references in the book are so strong. And I was like, yes, I'm so here for this. Yeah. Um, my mom would always send me to get falafel. And um, she would send me to get like 30 pieces of like 30 fala- falafels. And then I would always come, come home with like missing falafels in the back and I'm always like what happened to them like oh I just munched on them on the way so yeah that's that's pretty much my childhood (laughs) and your dad also owned and run a pizza restaurant right he did which was an like an impeccable uh, perk growing up to have a a dad who you know can provide endless pizzas because I my friends would always say like well why don't you get us a pizza to school and uh, I would do that, and then <laughs> it would. It gave me this, you know. Um, uh, my dad has a pizza restaurant, so it it was it was a it was an incredible feature, and my friends respected me and liked me for it. <laughs> <laughs> Instant friend points yeah. if you can provide pizza. Um, it's interesting hearing you talk about how you were a troublemaker because um, I'm assuming that extended to the classroom, and you actually ended up being a teacher as a profession from the age of 19 so it's very interesting that that came full circle for you for you having gone from like being a troublemaker to being the teacher it's 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 mainly from what my own teachers used to say because because I was such a troublemaker when I was a student honest uh, so they would say I like most of my teachers back then would say I hope that you'll be you'll become a teacher one day so um it did eventually happen I mean it was karma uh, that I became a teacher and it happened by pure coincidences because I was working in retail back then. And then I um, got this chance to go for a, an interview to teach English um, at, a pri- like, um, at an international, at a, a private school in Damascus, one of the, like, the best schools in Damascus. And uh, I got the job and it completely changed my, my perspective uh, of everything because I, uh, I, I was a... I was like a street hustler when I was in my late teens. I was always loitering in the streets, looking for trouble, or going for joy rides with my friends, drifting, running away from the cops, from the police. I, I, and and then it was it was a shocking, uh, like it was shocking to everybody, my relatives and my friends, when I became a teacher. They were like you are a teacher, like that? No, <laughs> that's that's not gonna work. But it did. It worked. <laughs> Something that I think will be interesting for listeners to know is that you were actually taught yourself English, right? I'm right in, in saying that you taught yourself through the power of of um, which boy band is it that you Backstreet cite? Boys. <laughs> Backstreet Boys. <laughs> yes, I did. How, so yeah, well, yeah. Tell us about this. Tell us about the process of teaching yourself a language. Um, well, it wasn't easy back then because I, so we uh, I was in year eight. Year seven, when they started teaching us, we were still learning the English alphabet. Year seven, year eight. So imagine you're like 13, 14, still learning the English alphabet. So at school, we didn't have the facility to, or, or the resources to learn English properly back then. Things changed now. Um, and because I had American cousins, American Syrian cousins who used to visit every summer, I was always very envious and jealous of their, of their language skills because to me, they spoke like the films that I watched. So I ended up just... Da- like listening to, to to songs and downloading lyrics so I can un- uh, and looking them up in the like in the actual dictionary, not a digital one, 
just to learn words and learn how to speak. But it was very funny because I ended up speaking like, like people, like because my res- my resources was was songs and and films. I didn't speak like a normal human being. I I, I spoke like a you know like a computer. <laughs> So, and, um, um, but when my dad noticed that I had this, like, you know, this urge to learn English, he started give, getting me books, which was very helpful because, uh, I was a- only able to speak English, but I didn't, I couldn't, and, and, and read, but I couldn't really, uh, write. Um, and then with those, all these self-help books and like self, um, uh, these English books, I, I was able to, I was able to like properly use the, the, the language as if it was my own and uh, ended up studying English literature um, at uni and uh, became an English teacher. <laughs> and I guess also it has, I mean, just learning it and being so good with it just ended up having the most profound impact on your life and the country that you've ended up living in and the ambition for ending up in the UK because obviously it was your access to the language that made you feel like that would be the place where you could, I guess, integrate, integrate the best. But before we get there, um, can you tell our listeners a little bit about how your involvement with protesting in Syria began? Um, Because against such tyranny and despite the grave risks, you were moved to speak out against the regime. um, And, I've heard you talk about how it seems like this was the catalyst for you. I've heard you talk about how it was at this moment that you found your voice. So can you tell our listeners about about that time? Well, gr- growing up in a dictatorship in a in a totalitarian um, uh, run country is is um, it's not easy. It's because these in these countries people are politically hijacked so you're not allowed to join a political i mean there aren't that there's only usually one political party and in Syria's case there was the Ba'ath party the only political the only governing and only political party in syria so and we uh, we we were not taught politics we were taught uh, not like we had a national we had a national a class called nationalism so we were taught about the achievements of the of the immortal leader as they would call him and um um we uh, basically we were not taught about our rights about rights to protest rights like you know freedom um freedom to speak out none of that so when the arab spring uh, ignited in 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 tunisia and then in, in 2011 pro- uh, the uprising started in damascus um collectively people in syria had this political awakening because they could see that uh they could see that this is a change, like this is a change that could bring, that could ch- a, a very positive change that could really affect us um, and affect our like future generations. So everyone, most people got involved and most people joined protests. Millions of Syrians joined protests and I happened to be one of them. And um, it was, I, I still remember, and I, I wrote about my first day going on a protest in a, in a country which is run by the secret police, essentially. Uh, the fear... Um, it was a cocktail of emotions because there was this fear that I could get caught and 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 punished for joining these protests, but also this uh, this this incredible awakening of like wow, like I you know I can go against the current and 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 speak out and uh, for what I believe in, and uh, it was beautiful. It was like one of the best moments of my life going on. Uh, of my life going on that first protest in Damascus in early 2011. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, I I have quite a politically engaged uh, listenership. So I think a lot of them will have experienced that kind of awakening that you cite there and that kind of of, feeling of empowerment, like our voice matters and we can do something and we can stand up um, for what we believe in. Um, But things took a bit of a turn for you um you 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 were one of was it eight people that was arrested after your first protest and reading about you you talk about your experiences and what happened to you during this time before you um started to seek asylum in syria and it it's it's not easy it's not easy reading about it and i cannot imagine what it was like living through it um how was the process of writing about that time for you 
and I'm like reluctant to say was it cathartic in any way or yeah how was the process of writing about that time for you um right so to give the (laughs) to give the listeners a bit of context I wrote about what happened as a result of protesting and, and filming protests and What happened is basically what happened to hundreds of thousands of Syrians is that they got arrested and detained and tortured. And so that happened to me as well. Um, I, um, so (laughs) how do I say this? So it was very bleak. And as you said, it, 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 I mean, it was bleak. It was dark. It was something that I never expected that would happen to me ever in my life. Um, and, uh, I, I've done interviews since I've been here and I talked about my experience, of, but I would just say that, yes, I got arrested and tortured, but I never went into details, you know, when you're writing a book yeah. and you want to write about a, a, something, you want to go for it, like, I want you to walk in my footsteps, so you want to go for the details, and recalling that memory was, it brought back some, like, uh, it was, it was really tough. <laughs> It was very, very tough. It, I, I struggled. I genuinely struggled. I could remember it very, very well. But I I think what happened after that incident is that I put it in a box and I left it there and I didn't want to touch it. I didn't want to open it for a while. But then when I wanted to write about it, I opened that box and with opening that box, it came all the emotions and uh, I struggled. I genuinely struggled. Like I would um, come back from these writing sessions and go to like to, to my sofa and and I f- uh, genuinely feel like I'm paralyzed. Like it debilitated me. I I didn't. It really affected me. But then after like a couple of months, it it, it was it helped me reprocess it Be- because I because in in the past I put it in a box and I left it there and I didn't want to talk about it. But then talking about it in details, I reprocessed it and, and magically it was cathartic. It, it, help, it helped me. Like I don't, I no longer have, so I do have nightmares, uh, reoccurring nightmares about what happened. But now the frequency of the nightmares is a, is a lot less than what it used to be. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah, it made me think a lot about, and we'll may perhaps get onto this later, but how important it is for um, refugees and asylum seekers to be given adequate mental health support um, when when they arrive in a country, for example, like the UK and how necessary that is. So I, I'd love to talk to you about that in, in, in a little bit. Um, your journey seeking asylum in 2015 took nearly three months. Um, yours and other refugee stories are so important. And I think what's so blindingly clear about your work is how important it is to hear everyone's stories um do you think this is why you're potentially so passionate about storytelling through the medium of film and photography um and kind of making sure that people are given the opportunity to share their stories i mean i am a storyteller i used to t- tell stories for a living when i was an english teacher <laughs> so and I, and i i could i i am i i believe in the power of storytelling the reason why stories are very powerful is because they tend to connect us, you know. So if I tell you about if I tell you about the plight of refugees in Afghanistan by only giving you numbers, it won't be as powerful as as if I put a face on the numbers. If I tell you about, for example, Fatima's stories or Abdullah's story and how and and tell you about their upbringing and what they had to go through until like they, what schools did they go to? What what what's their Spotify playlist or like? where do they go traveling and then what happened and how did they have to flee then it will be easier for you to you know to to understand the 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 the, the, the crisis or like the 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 numbers uh, by listening to just one story and i that's what i did is that when i did my journey i wanted to tell my story so i chose the i chose the, the um documenting it filming it be, because there were there were so many misconceptions back then about uh, the numbers of people who are arriving or why there, some people were asking questions of like why refugees have smartphones, for example, or like how come some of them uh, have designer bags. Um, so I, I was reading that even before I did my journey and I, I concluded that there is, there's a gap here. People, 
people don't really understand what drives someone to to to, to leave their home and to seek asylum um, in a different continent. And um, putting a face on a big crisis is something that I believe in because it does work. It it you know it makes people uh, empathize and 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 more more importantly. It drives action. People will get involved. People will go and like volunteer in a camp or raise money or do something to help. Um, and yeah, so I, I filmed my whole journey and it was featured in the BBC series Exodus, Our Journey to Europe, which was like very successful in a way that I went to for like other jobs to like refugee camps. And I met people who told me that, well, we volunteered because we watched that documentary and it really affected us. And like we wanted to do something to help. And for me, that's that's the measure of success if something actually drives change. Um, and yeah. Uh, in, I was actually really interested to read in the book um, because you talk about the experience of being involved in the BBC documentary Exodus, um, which you won a BAFTA for. Um, however, you wrote about how you feel you weren't properly credited or compensated for your involvement in it, which was really sad to read um not altogether surprising to be honest um unfortunately I wish I I wish I did find it surprising but I wasn't altogether surprised has that affected your work as well having had that experience of working with you know a a big on a big film like that and having having um it having so much success has that affected the, the work that you do since presumably to make sure that the same thing doesn't happen to other people I had like hours and hours of rushes. I filmed my whole journey and then I met the filmmakers who told me that they're making this series, which is basically, it, it was the same concept. They went to other countries, gave people smartphones to film their journeys and get to, uh, and f- to film their journeys. And um, they would also follow them and film them along the way. So I had already done that independently. And I've had this, like this, like um, very crucial rushes, which, which, which were essential to the success of the, of the documentary. Now I, um, I I wasn't a documentary filmmaker. I was a teacher, so I don't know the industry very well. But I asked two questions, and, and I, I asked if I was going to be paid or credited, to which they both answered yes. Um, and the reason why I asked that, because I don't like to do work for free. I mean, no one should be doing any work for free. <laughs> and people should be credited for their work. So when that didn't happen, um, back then I didn't really... Re- I mean, it was very... It was a massive letdown because that was my first, I am now a documentary filmmaker, you know, and, but that was my introduction to the, to the industry, which really didn't really help my confidence. Um, and that letdown didn't help me. Uh, it wasn't a positive experience. Um, um, and as a result, I, I really like, I had a phase where I was like, can, is, should I do something else? I really want to make films, but is it, I had this negative experience and it might happen again. So it did change me. I am uh, in the way I work now when I photograph or film people is that I give them full agency. I like, I am very honest and clear and open about what the work that we're doing or like what, what to expect and what not to expect. And also like, I now also like really like um, (laughs) when I am about to start working on a project, um, I like, I fight to get the right credit and to be, to be to be paid fairly, you know. And it's there was a case where I was going to work on a project, and I'm not going to name names, but they said, "Oh well, yeah, but I mean, you're Syrian," and I was like, "Yeah, but that doesn't mean that I get paid less. <laughs> I can provide you with the same, you know, the same service, and like I have the certain skills. So if being Syrian, that doesn't mean that I should be paid less than someone who's British." Um, and yeah, in, in, wow. in conclusion, I mean, exploiting other people's stories and and not giving them the credit and paying them is something that I try to um, fight really hard right now. Absolutely. It feels like it was just one of the uh, letdowns, perhaps, that um, <laughs> you were presented with when you arrived in the UK. Obviously, there's what I really appreciated about the story is like, it's a, there are, you, you always reference like incredible moments of kindness from, from humans. But what was interesting to read about um, in particular for me was how you emphasized that you always saw Europe 
um, as a kind of heartland of democracy. Um, but in the book, you write about how you were profoundly let down by the reality. It must have been really challenging to realize that when you when you arrived. I mean, our first encounter with Europe, when we did our second crossing, our first crossing to Europe, the boat sank, we couldn't make it. The second crossing, um, we were beaten up by European border control. Uh, in, in Greece. Greece? Yes, in the Aegean. That was literally our first encounter. So the, they, were, they, they were beating us with sticks and they, they stole the fuel, they, they took the fuel tank from the dinghy and broke the engine and left us midwater without any fresh without any fresh water. So um, that's a really big letdown because expectations didn't really align with what happened. My expectation was, wow, like I'm, I'm fleeing a dictatorship. I'm going to this continent, which like, I think I was, the le- my, my level of naivete was very high because I expected like, you know, where people are respected and treated equally and, and, and but that didn't happen. My, my initial, um, um, experience it didn't happen on the contrary we we they they left us um, to die um um and um b- but what i tried to do th- w- while writing this book is that i wanted to talk about the negative experiences such as that one which uh, but i also wanted to talk about the positive ones because when we talk about europe i tend in my writing to separate governments from people from like communities. So while governments right now, and especially now it's even worse than what we did it uh, when we did the journey in 2015, 2016, is that governments now have completely shut their borders. Uh, they've completely militarized and put fences uh, on the borders. The um, pushbacks are happening, which are against international law. They're happening in Greece. They're happening in Croatia. They're happening in Lithuania. Um, the 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 British government uh, the British government's rhetoric around refugees also is like I, it's it's inhumane to say the least. But I also so I talk about that, but I also talk about like pop, like communities and what they've done to help and uh, how I personally benefited from the kindness of strangers that I met along the way. There are so many instances that I can think about. Um, one that springs to mind is when you, when there was a man, I think, in Calais giving out people jumpers and then he ran up by the time that you, you reached your point in the queue and he gave you the jumper from his back. And yeah. there are these moments of kindness from individuals throughout. And I have to say, like, the world feels seemingly heavier and heavier, like, every yeah. week. <laughs> it's, 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 a bleak, it's a bleak time. And... I found reading about those moments of kindness from individuals up, uplifting. How did these moments from individuals impact you and how, how in moments when the world feels heavy, is that what you find yourself coming back to in order to feel a bit lighter? Um, you know, hope on its own can be very passive. Like if you... Uh, so I'm going to take you as a case study here, okay? You don't, you don't just hope that the fashion industry change their ethics. You actually go out there and do something about it. <laughs> so when, when hope is paired with action, it can become very positive and it become very active. So what I've tried to do in the book is that I didn't... It, it, the people that I've met along the way throughout this whole journey, from my prison cell in Syria all the way to Britain, is that people who've like done incredible things, you know, in that situation, no matter how small they were. But to me, as someone, it really restored my faith in humanity. So when that man in in the Calais and jungle gave me his jumper after he ran out of jumpers, that is, I mean, it could be a small act, but for me, it was, despite the, despite how bleak my situation was, you know, I was stateless, I was homeless, I, I had no passport. I literally had no roof over my head. Like I was, I hit rock bottom. But this man cho- chose, he made a conscious decision to be positive and kind, give me a jumper. And instantly, like, I, it made me like feel hopeful again and made me continue. And I think this is how I see it right now. What gives me hope during these big times is that pe- people who are out there doing incredible things, people who are trying to change the world in, in, every, in any way possible. And it doesn't have to be super, like a, 
I, I think it doesn't. Our actions shouldn't be like this. We don't. It doesn't have to be this grand action. No, you can you can do something very small. I uh, and it just like giving a jumper to someone who needs it, and it it will bring a lot of positivity. That's really encouraging. Yeah, thank you. I was having like a, a I went around to see my mum yesterday and we were having a cup of tea and I was just like, you know, in in that kind of moment of feeling like really do me and like what what like you know, what does all of this even matter? And she was like, You can only do what you can exactly. do and you have to trust that everyone is doing all all that they can do and then we have I'm like yeah. we have this ripple effect exactly, but- and lots of people doing as much and as possible. Otherwise, does if Listen, it can get very overwhelming sometimes. If we, because the world sometimes feel like it's falling apart in terms of climate, in terms of like our societies or politics or like these man-made crises around the world. Um, if we care, like, I mean, if you are doing your bits, that's enough. You don't have to, to, to worry about everything else. Just do your bits and, and, and things will be better. But otherwise, it'll get, it'll get very overwhelming. You touched uh, there on climate, and this is something that I would I would be I'm keen to talk to you about because obviously, as the climate crisis worsens, which judging by the well, now we have the IPCC report, we know that nothing's going to get better for at least thirty years, and ultimately that does mean more climate refugees. It more, means more displaced people. Um, how we, we when we have that knowledge, how does that make you? think about what that means for the future of displaced people and refugees and the crisis and what would you like to see change i would like to see some compassion in politicians because as long as the focus is on how do we secure our borders as as long as we want to be to uh, the politics of isolation and like closing our borders and protecting our borders and if this this is all if you this is the mantra that has been I have been hearing since I got here. Let's protect our borders. Let's keep our borders safe. Yeah, but, uh, but what about everyone else? You know, because it's inevitable that people will flee. People like the movement of people. The, the numbers will keep on increasing because of the climate and because of the other man-made crises. And if we keep focusing on how we secure our borders and forget about everyone else, it's really not going to help. You know. So if we take Britain as an example, Britain in the last few months, uh, they've been talking about the new immigration bill, which is essentially uh, they want to uh, um, they want to create a two tier system in the immigration um, uh, in 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 our immigration uh, in Britain, and and the the system will be based your right to asylum will be based on the journey that you've taken. So if you were resettled, you will be granted, you know, you can have access to, to, to welfare, you can, have, uh, apply, you can apply for a family unification. But if you took an irregular route, um, then that will limit your access to, 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 to welfare or to like family unification, etc. So um, that's not going to work. You know, it's, it's why, especially that at the same time, the British government, while issuing this, they have cut the the foreign aid budget from 0.7% of GDP to 0.5%. So if I don't want to fund projects abroad, you know, one of the strongest economies in the world, as like a British economy, if I'm cutting my fund to projects abroad that are, you know, providing fresh water to, to communities, um, protecting women and children, and at the same time, I want to limit uh, the number of people who will arrive here, that's not helpful. That's not a politics of compassion. And it's 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 uh, what I would like to see. I would like to see that, um, uh, uh, especially in Europe, uh, is that you know European governments and the British government they take their fair share of refugees and migrants in the, uh, in the world because so far they're not. Britain uh, has less than one percent of the refugee population now in the world. But despite that, we, you, you, they, they complain the most about immigration and refugees. It must feel so frustrating to feel like there is this rhetoric of misinformation. It is frustrating and also it's um, also disappointing. Uh, I'll, I'll also give you an, an example. During the referendum, the Leave campaign uh, put billboards that said that Turkey is join, joining the EU and millions of people will end up coming to Britain, which is 
you know, a lie because <laughs> Turkey hasn't joined the EU and millions of people didn't come from Turkey to, to, to Britain. The, the frustrating thing is that people voted, so they practice their democratic rights, which is voting, based on lies. So while we say that it's a democratic thing, okay, it's, but, but to me it's like a delusional democracy because I'm, if I'm voting based on lie, that's not democracy, you know? So, and this misinformation, which is often recycled, in the media, because um, recently the number of boats which are crossing the channels have increased, okay? Um, and every time this is reported in the media, they say uh, a record number of boats have crossed this uh, today from France to, to the UK. However, like uh, the, the immigration statistics have been released recently, the number of asylum seekers in Britain dropped by, I think, around 20% compared to last year. So... Yes, the number of boats increased because because of the pandemic, people were not taking the lorries. So that's why they had to take the boats. But if you watch the news, you genuinely freak out. You freak out because you feel like there is this, you know, people are taking over or this conspiracy theory, the great replacement is that white people will be replaced by <laughs> by Middle Easterns and Asians and, and, and black people. So it's, it is very frustrating. And um, um, last week, um, I did a life in the UK test, and this is a test that you have to do when you are preparing to apply for citizenship. And one of the questions I found it very interesting is like the percentage of people in Britain who have a grandparent who wasn't born in Britain is only ten percent. Imagine, wow. Imagine it's only ten wow. percent of like people in Britain who have a grandparent who wasn't born in Britain. So it's it's really not. I mean, it's it's the um, it's it's a distraction. The reason why my, uh, refugees and migrants are always weaponized by politicians because it's a distraction from the actual failures. You know, Britain has more food banks than McDonald's. To me, also, like, how is this even possible? You know, in a country like this, it's because of decades of austerity. It's of like mishandling the pandemic. It's because of the uh, you know the offshore funds. It's because of all the billionaires. So it's not us, you know, it's not us that are bankrupting Britain. <laughs> you write about in the book how you're entitled to a certain amount of money per week, or you were entitled to a certain amount of money per week. You never took a penny from yeah. the UK government. You were a, front, a frontline worker during the pandemic. You volunteered to work for the NHS at your local hospital as a cleaner. Um, and you actually ended up literally changing policy so can you talk to us about what happened to you during the pandemic and the um and, and the job that you did with the nhs yes so when the pandemic hit um now i know what happened so back then i thought i was losing my mind but now i know that i was it was uh, i was uh, walking in the world of triggers <laughs> because right the, uh, right that's interesting yeah, um because um you know seeing cues outside the shops seeing like um uh, uh, the, the panic, the, the people like staying at home. And to me, that reminded me of, of what happened um, back home in, in Syria. Uh, so um, as a way of coping, I wanted to do something. So that's a, for a selfish reason. I'll start with my selfish reason to, for why I wanted to take that job is because I wanted to take some control. I wanted to do something to help or otherwise I was going to lose my mind. But also like a less... And I mean, not, not a selfish reason, I would say, is because the NHS desperately wanted cleaners um, because to disinfect hospitals on a daily basis. And I saw the job post. It's my local hospital in Leytonstone when I lived there to, um, two years ago. And uh, so I took the job. Um, um, it was a very demanding job, physically and mentally. Um, you, um, and, um, um, but I, I mean, I did, I did the job as best as I can. And while I was there, I was also like, just, I mean, everyone who worked in my ward was, um, uh, were migrants, people who were not born in Britain. So I was just fascinated by their stories. And I started like, I, with their permission, taking their portraits on my phone during breaks and posting their stories online and also filming with them, with the hospital's permission, of course. And um, um, yeah, I was like, things, we were under so much pressure. We were witnessing things which are like um, very difficult. Uh, the scale of the death in hospitals, like um, the suffering, the people being separated from their families. But we were still like, you know, 
together fighting like a unit. Until one day I was walking to the hospital and I saw, I read in the Independent that the government announced a bereavement scheme. And the bereavement scheme essentially is a scheme which will protect migrant workers on the front line protect their families in case they die. If if a migrant frontline worker in a hospital die, so anyone fr- who works in a hospital, their their family get indefinite leave to remain, which is the bare minimum. Now, the government, when they did that, uh, for some absurd reason, decided to exclude cleaners, um, porters, and ward hosts. And if, if anyone who's listening right now, has ever been to a hospital, you know that these jobs are mostly done by migrants, you know? Um, So I thought that was very unfair, and I I struggled to understand the reasoning behind why they would do that. They should start with these people, you know, because they're on minimum wage, they they, they needed the most. So I... I went to my, I went I was thinking about what I can do and because I be, I'm a filmmaker you know I believe in the power of the moving image and what putting a face on us in a bigger story making it personal it could do something so I recorded a video to Boris Johnson it was like less than three minutes I put it on Twitter and four hours later I was like trending and my video was watched like four or five million times and it was shared by tens of thousands of people and uh, as a result the government announced a U-turn and they included everybody, which was incredible. <laughs> it, I honestly, I, I think it's so amazing and it's it's so encouraging because I think so often we feel like, what what can one person do? What's the point? And the fact that you made that change and for people who you've talked about, you know, your fellow frontline workers, um, you've talked about them as your family and to have made that change I know with with them in mind that must have felt so so good. It did. It, it felt really really good. Like I, I I I was genuinely like I was over the moon, and because I was proud because you know it, I like tens of thousands of people like benefited from that U turn, you know, and people who like the bedrock of the NHS, like the like the, the people who 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 like in desperate need for some protection while they're risking their lives and their families' lives, and I. Yes, it, it gave me like it brought. I mean, it made me. It made me feel really good. But then, for the long run, I was like, I shouldn't really be doing that, you know, in the first place, because the government shouldn't be coming up with this, you know, malicious policy where they exclude the people who need this policy. And just like Marcus Rashford, you know, shouldn't have to like uh, campaign to feed hungry children. It's it, it's it's not our job. It's. It, but however, I mean, it's it is it is our job to hold people hold the government accountable, um, and I think I did that, and uh, it felt really really good. <laughs> Would you ever consider going into politics? Yes. Big question. I yes, know. Yes, definitely, one hundred percent. I would love to. You know, I would love to. Like, but I still don't know where I can. Where can I make change the most? Whether it's from the inside or the outside, but. I, I feel like, especially in Britain, I mean, America, they have AOC. Um, uh, we, we, we don't have, like, uh, that many influential leaders, you know? Like, lead, we don't have leaders who can inspire us, who are, like, doing great work that can, you know, can encourage us to, to get involved more. And I think that's why people in Britain are becoming more and more disillusioned with politicians and politics in general here. Um, but getting into politics is not an easy game like i i'm learning like now i'm in a phase where like i to be a politician is to be a leader and i want i'm learning how to become a leader so if and when i i decide to get into politics i i I have the means you know i have the means to 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 to, to be good at it wow what an what what a next step that would be (laughs) Honestly, reading that you're reading the, reading the <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite a career change, but I guess, nothing, I guess nothing would be, would probably feel like much of a surprise. I don't know, like reading your book, <laughs> so there's so much of it that just feels like almost like a film. Yeah, I got that comment actually from someone who read it and he said, I had to remind myself every once in a while that this is a true story. <laughs> would you ever consider, I'm sure you'll have people wanting to make make your memoir into a movie yes there are people who are already like um interested but um i 
I haven't made a decision yet. I might not do it, but I don't. I still don't. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Just as look, I mean, you just have to be in control of that decision, yeah. and yeah. yeah, you'll come up with the right. I could literally talk to you all day about absolutely everything, but I'm conscious of time. <laughs> oh, bless you! Quick fire with Hassan. Wake up early or have a lie in. Uh, have a lie in. Full English or fish and chips. Fish and chips. Falafel and hummus. Falafel and hummus. Falafel and fine. hummus. Falafel and hummus. <laughs> <laughs> Marmite or jam? Oh, definitely jam. <laughs> Pizza or pasta? Pizza. Filmmaking or photography? Oh, you can't do that to me. <laughs> I just did. Um, filmmaking. TV or radio? TV. Podcasts or Netflix? Netflix. Sunrise or sunset? Sunrise. And finally, routine or spontaneity? Routine. Question for you. How do you make the world's best hummus? How do you make the world's best hummus? So you soak your chickpeas um, for um, like overnight and then you mash them and you leave them in the fridge for a while. Um, and then they have to, so the, 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 you turn it into a paste, you mash the chickpeas and then you turn, turn them into a paste, put them in the fridge and then you put them in a blender. You add tahini, olive oil, garlic and salt and you blend it and that's it. And don't add any other great, great crazy ingredients because I feel like white people have colonized our hummus and they started adding like avocado and like Marmite and all of that. Please do not colonize our hummus. <laughs> is lemon allowed? Lemon is allowed, yes. Did I not mention that? Yes. A time- and, but tinned chickpeas, absolutely not? I mean, you can, you can, you can get away with it. But if you want to make like proper hummus, you, you bring like the, you know, like a, not tinned, the ones that come like a, um, in a bag the colonization of food is a whole other podcast yeah. <laughs> <laughs> despite everything you've been through you're always resolutely positive and I think listeners will have heard you know you're you you, you have a great laugh and a, and a great kind of sense of humor um I'd love to hear what is currently bringing you hope um I think I have hope in young people and they, they, they're young, they, they are way more engaged than we are, used to be when we were young. And they're like out there campaigning and protesting. And, and like, I see these people on TikTok, like doing, um, you know, explanations about certain policies and like what to do and being viewed by millions. I think, they, I think that's hopeful. I think the fact that young people are being more and more switched on engaged brings me, brings me hope. Love that. Um, if you could advise listeners to try one thing today to help them feel hope, hopeful, what would it be? I would say that because, as we as we said before, that there's um, the world seems bleak right now in terms of like on so many aspects. I think it's always good to look at the positives as well <laughs> to outweigh the negatives. And uh, to me, I am genuinely obsessed with like the success or how fast we, as a humanity, were able to to, to develop the vaccine against COVID nineteen. I mean. It, what usually takes a decade was done in like, you know, less than 18 months. So that is positive. There's the, the medicine and, and, and science. And uh, yeah, just, I think focus on the positives. It helps you balance. Love mm. that. And finally, what is one thing you hope your future self will have achieved? No pressure to achieve anything else. <laughs> You've already done so much, but I know you're someone who is ambitious. So I'm wondering if there's there's one. Thing. I want to be. Uh, well, there's a few. I I would love to be a dad one day, inshallah, one day, and uh, I would like to. I would like to get involved in politics, um, and uh, drive like. I want to be making some more positive change. I want, that's it, really. Whether on a personal level or like on a, on a, on like a, in my community, in my neighborhood, or like in my city. That's, that's what I would like to do. Thank you so much. This has been such an inspiring and encouraging <laughs> interview. And I'm also just so in awe of you and a huge congratulations on your book. It is such an accomplishment and Thank you. it's going to be so successful. So... <laughs> Huge congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.